So guys, guess where we are? We are in the city that never sleeps. We are in Mumbai. Yes. And my team abducted me in this morning. I woke up at 4 a.m. in the morning and my teammates who are here behind the camera have abducted me and brought me here in Mumbai. And uh, this is like 10 a.m. right? It's 10 a.m. right now and we are here for a podcast. You must have seen the thumbnail, okay? And you know it who it is. It is architect Kutub Manviwala. And we are going to talk to him about his work. Uh, we are right outside his office, but we are doing a pre-shoot. We call it a prequel pod prequel podcast we do that before starting the podcast i would thank my teammate who is from mumbai and without her the podcast was not possible she helped me a lot and managing all this from city of nagpur was not possible for me and thank you all for subscribing to my youtube channel and showing some love on instagram but if you are new here please subscribe to my channel what you will find here you will find podcasts you will find interviews you will find shorts and much more about the vlogs so please subscribe to my YouTube channel and also on Instagram, the, all the links are in the description. So now we will go and talk to him in his office. Let's go. Come check. <laughs> Thank you. I vaguely remember you, but I can't place you which year you were working in. Sorry? You are working here, no? No, no, no. I'm from Nagpur. Achha. Nagpur here. Yes, yes. We have three projects. Okay. And fourth one we are working on. One is Shivaji Nagar. Uh huh. So all are high rise buildings. Ah, high rise. With a rich experience of nearly three decades, architect Kutub Manviwala has over the years developed a reputation to provide innovative design solution within the context. He is an alumnus of Rachana Sansad Mumbai, graduated from Academy of Architecture in the year 1988. Mr. Mandviwala engages in various work experiments with new spatial concepts intensifying existing urban landscapes and encompassing all fields of design from the urban scale to interiors. Known as an architect who consistently pushes the boundaries of sustainable design, he has done various townships, high-rise buildings, residential, commercial, hotels, hospitals and office interior projects to his credits across India. He believes that great buildings and spaces can inspire, influence and enhance the life of its users and the community. Over the year, he has developed an architectural language forging design sensibilities that are inherent to sites, climate and conditions. His approach to design is simplistic with a minimal and modern flair. Now let's go and talk with him more about his design and his design philosophy. Hi sir, how are you? I am good. You can see me. <laughs> yes. So we, we all know how amazing work you do. And we also Thank saw you. a short uh, intro video about your work, how your office functions and what kind of projects you have done. But before I start with throwing questions at you, let me ask you how many clients call you had today before we entered the office? Uh, today, a couple of clients did call me in the morning. Someone wanted to come and uh, meet me right away. So I told him that, you know, I have something already there, but he kept keeps insisting, he kept insisting. <laughs> so I said, okay, come, one of my associates will uh, look into it. So, uh, welcome to our podcast. The name says Me Time with Sagar. Thank so, you. in this podcast, we'll know about you, your work and your design philosophy and end it with some wonderful round of candid questions. Like it's a rapid fire round, round but not like a Karanjor wala scene where mm -hmm. we'll put you in some controversies. <laughs> but it is some fun. So, are you up for I'm it? I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll, I'll just throw away, uh, throw the first question at you now. Okay. It is about site context. Uh -huh. So, when you start a new project, how often do you learn the special history and the culture of this place? Uh, say, if you see the kind of work that we are doing, the first thing is, uh, we personally believe that work has to be contextual. Uh, because every site speaks for itself. And as an architect, you personally believe that every site is a new canvas. Yes. Now, if you don't take the contextual part, if you don't take the history, if you don't take the people out there, then uh, the new canvas becomes an old canvas, you know. Then you're just doing a replica of what you have done. And if you see the kind of work we are doing, we personally believe that we should not be having cookie cutters. So one of the best ways to not do cookie cutters is that, you know, uh, you use sight as a context and uh, you take that as one of the biggest things because the sight gives you 
what it has to be done there. Okay. Then it is the people, then it is the requirements, and then obviously the nature comes into play, and that's how you make it contextual and sustainable in the place. I think the mosque you did in Kanpur had that kind of thing. It's a wonderful project. It was a very small mosque and yes. very amazing, and we had a very nice concept where the mosque itself did sajda on the west side, you know, so we took a square and we tilted yes. the square. And uh, uh, because we had to face the west, because yes. Mecca is on west from here, so we did get an opportunity of uh, having the north and south uh, to play around with, from where we took a lot of light, and that we kind of put with a jali and made it very nice and very interesting. So the light came from the north-south, made it very sustainable because there was no heat coming in, and uh, we had this nice water body on the southwest from where the water, air, uh, air kind of wind came in. And that wind in the dry, arid climate was a little cooler, a little humid and made it very comfortable for people. That was really great to know that religious architecture can be done in a certain different way. Like we see mosques or temples in a very different way <laughs> as it was designed before. But the project I saw which was very different. So that was nice. So was the temple, you know, we went by the Namaste concept. Yes. So in one campus we had the opportunity of doing the uh, mandir also and the mosque also. Okay. And both of them were very beautifully done. And we had these beautiful jalis and beautiful uh, work which was set right here. So I'll, I'll go to my next question for you. So can you share a memorable instance where you had to modify your design to unexpected contextual factors? Uh, like was it in Kanpur? Uh, Kanpur was not so much uh, to that uh, this, okay. But uh, I'll give you a very different example. It is, uh, uh, you know, we are, do, we are working on a redevelopment project and we had to do these uh, redevelopment houses for people. And obviously when you do it in Mumbai or anywhere, you do a house, it was a 350, 375 square feet house. So the tendency is to do a living, dining, kitchen, bedroom kind of an one bedroom, hall, kitchen, apartment. But then we went, we saw the lifestyle of the people. We saw that people don't uh, live the way we think people live. People don't eat the way we think people eat. Yes. Uh, so they had a very different life and different culture to it. And when we started absorbing that, we changed our design to the lifestyle of the people which was there. And we also made it inclusive by sharing those designs with the people, taking their feedback and modifying our design to make it contextual to the lifestyle of the people out there. Yes. And today when we finish that, and in each house there are virtually two generations staying in 350, 375 okay. and they are so happy because the design was modified to their uh, needs yes. which was not the regular apartment which you yes. have it in Mumbai. Rather than architect uh, designing it, you designed it for what they required. Yeah. It was very personalized yes. and that to do in a building was very difficult. So uh, now knowing about the site context, we are moving to sustainable architecture. Uh, everyone talks about it but let's understand it from the client's perspective. Sometimes they are not immediately sold on sustainable design choices. So how do you convince them? Uh, so it depends. Now what is the sustainable part that you are talking of? Okay. Uh, what is it that you, you want to do? Okay. Why is a client saying no? The client is telling because you are saying, I want to put these materials, this, this, this. Certain things are today become a norm, whether it is rainwater harvesting, solar panels, you know, recycling water, that is a norm. So where does the client get into difference? Is all these materials and costs which comes in. I personally believe sustainability starts much prior to that. Okay. okay. I personally believe as an architect that sustainability starts from planning part of it. Okay. How you plan your work, uh, this, you know. Like you see the Wokhat school that we have yes. done, you know, in Aurangabad. We placed every classroom which were north south to take the north south light. We had all no direct sunlight coming into classrooms. So all the classrooms become sustainable in its own way. Yes. You don't need, uh, you know, too much of uh, artificial light. You know, just like here, you know, you have this light coming yes. and you don't need artificial light. 
So or throughout the day when the school is running, you have got so much natural light coming inside. Because there is no heat coming inside, there is a minimum requirement of any mechanical uh, system required to cool the place. Correct. Then you work on the other parts. Now, we felt climatically it was a good place to use something like exposed concrete. Now, when we use exposed concrete, it requires no maintenance, it requires no paint, it is timeless, it's lifetime. So, it depends from where you are starting sustainability and what is your concept of sustainability. Is sustainability only saying that, oh, I have to use recycled materials? Is sustainability only saying that I have to, you know, use things which are uh, within uh, this kilometer and I have to see that? You know, I think, yeah, those are there. I am not saying I am not denying those things. But I am saying that there is far more beyond that for it, you know. I think the definition of sustainability was, I think it is this much like rainwater harvesting or whatever things you told, ki people just decide on that factors, ki we have done this, our house is sustainable now. But I want to ask, was any convincing needing, needed there regarding the sustainable design? Uh, I don't think so. Now if I tell you that I am doing this design like this, I am planning this like this, and just like this, there's your school might require 50% of the light which is there. As a client, why would you say no? Definitely. If I tell you I am using, um, you know, this kind of natural uh, concrete finish, which for years you don't need to paint, you don't need to maintain, and the child can't spoil it, why would you say no? Yes. So it is user-centric of what you are doing, okay, also. You know, it's what you want to do, how it works with that space, and how it eventually, uh, uh, you know, gets completed in its holistic manner and that is what sustainable is all about you know so it's not just the materials and just not the cost which is there i think it's also like how architects explain it to the client in what they want to listen yeah, in those uh, terms i think every client today is literate enough to understand sustainability but the mindset as you said rightly is that oh sustainable means mujhe ye ye points karna hai aur ye points ke liye ye cost aayega you know, but are we talking just for points as sustainability or are we talking sustainability as sustainability yes, yes. per se? <laughs> and also the play of light you talked about, it also invites students to come to the school and have that play with the oh, light and shadow so which interests them interest to study. them and secondly when you are making something so connected to nature, you know, so it's a very child centric uh, yes, opportunity yes, that yes. you are giving to the child, you know. It's a scale which is so different, uh, it's so uh, child-centric, so user-centric. And when it is so child-centric and user-centric, they are going to like it, yes. you know. It reminded me of my school. So, all my classrooms were facing towards the courtyard. It had light coming in and all corridors were connected with courtyards. It was wonderful. Uh, we did another school which is Dainik Bhaskar, uh, Sanskar Valley in uh, Bhopal and where we had the classrooms through the courtyard. Again, considering the climatic condition, you know, we had a beautiful valley and in which we put these uh, blocks which were there. And uh, amazing part was that courtyard even did absorb the sound. Yeah, nice. So most of the times when I went after the school, the doors, the teachers kept the doors open. But because of the courtyard, you know, there was very little sound which was getting transmitted from one side to the yes, other. Yes. Any specific time in architecture history that resonates with you the most, and there's a sub question to it and how does it influences your design philosophy? So, uh, obviously when we were in college, we were influenced by many things, yes. okay. Uh, I was quite taken up by the Indian architecture. I was also quite taken up by some of the architecture in Isfahan in uh, uh, Iran, which was so decorative at that time and how you know amazing it is. But then when I started moving and I started getting into a professional line, you know, uh, it was in the 90s mm -hmm. and I had an opportunity somewhere to get a hand on a book from Walter Gropius and uh, that kind of uh, worked a little on me and, you know, I changed from uh, looking more into decorative to more minimalism that I came into, somewhat influenced by Bauhaus but not uh, kind of this, mm -hmm. and then Mies van der Rohe and you know the of uh, the concept of how you can draw minimum to gain the maximum, you know. So and then eventually that is what started reflecting in my designs. 
I for sure started tweaking with some forms inside that rather than just keeping it very simple. But that is what uh, made me start in the 90s and when people were doing very decorative architecture, very mm -hmm. classical architecture, I was finding it very tough to explain people that you know you can do buildings simple and obviously commercial clients used to tell me that you're not ready to work hard because we didn't have so many uh, computer generated perspectives so you had to have hard drawings and you know, the hard drawings just showed straight lines which were there so which was very difficult for people to understand. It is in the late 90s when people got exposed to that architecture that it became a part of the you know style of architecture in India. So I have one random question in my mind right now while you were speaking yeah. about how you started your firm. We see many of the young architects who start their firm find it very difficult but you started in the 90s when I think architecture was not at that peak. People were not hiring architects all like for every day and another day. So how was it experienced there? How you started it? Uh, so, uh, I had one uh, uh, disadvantage which was that, that when uh, I had worked in a uh, senior architecture firm when I was studying in college and four years after my college. So for sure I knew how architecture, uh, architect's office works per se. I kind of uh, had that but yes it was tough, uh, we were, it was not so simple and uh, to get uh, clients, to get projects, it was, but you have to keep working, you know. Yes, yes. And uh, I personally always say that way, that when you pitch for 10 projects, eventually three or four will happen, you know. Uh, so you have to keep that count and keep working hard and keep pitching and uh, you have to have the diversity yes. of doing everything. If you keep the diversity, then you create more opportunities for yourself. And that's what we did. We were doing hotels, we were doing uh, hospital, we were doing residential, we were doing commercial, we were doing school, everything that came our way. And we learned the science of how to do that and we moved on. So guys, I think you should learn from him what he have just said now. <laughs> how when you start a firm, you should not like ek saal mein, everything would happen for you overnight. You have to start doing it again and again and then it will eventually happen for uh, you. One thing I'll always say to anyone, hard work never goes waste. Yes. Uh, you will be surprised that you will be worked on, you have worked on a project and nothing has happened for years, you know, and the client says, I don't like it, something happens. But somewhere, few years down the line, the client comes back and says that, you know, you had, I'd work with you on that. It didn't happen that time. Okay, we thought something different. But now I want to come back and work with you. Nice so uh, I, I think you have to just put your head down and uh, just give your best shot, you know. Yeah. And you will be are all at times you are surprised that you know uh, the project that you are least expecting to turn around mm -hmm. that turns around and the project that you are yes. really really thinking that this is my project only and this is not going anywhere slips out of your hand. So. There is no this uh, uh, of uh, this of saying that I am going to work hard on this and not going to work on hard on this. We need to work hard on everything, everything. that comes our way. Only thing will happen, someone will reject you, but yeah. there is another opportunity standing. <laughs> but that you. rejection is never a rejection. It's yes. somewhere you have put in what you thought, and if it is right, then few years down the line it will come back to you. Yes. I think that is happening for me right now for in the content uh, field. I, I think that was what our basic funda was yeah. and that's why we never uh, got upset if things didn't work our way. We just said, okay, this didn't work, let's move forward. Yes. So moving forward now, there's a next question for you. Can you share your experience of a project in which intentionally rework conventional architecture language to create a unique design? Yeah, again we did it. Uh, we did it in that same redevelopment project which was there. We are not so much into architecture which is very ornate or ornamental or this. So we were doing, when we finished the master plan, our buildings are very modern, very sleek, very clean. But then uh, when we started working on the elevation, we worked on this, walked on the streets. And when we walked on the streets, we realized that this area is very traditional. And there is a certain eye line which is there, eyesight or eye line which is there. And when you walk around that, the architecture in that eyesight of about 20 meters, 30 meters is all very different, you know. It has got its uh, style, it has got a style which is to the uh, people of that place. It has got a lot of materials which are there like stone and everything. 
So even though we were planning buildings which were tall, we felt that at a till a certain level, we should modify and come out out of our comfort zone to a non-comfort zone mm -hmm. and design buildings which resonates with the surrounding and becomes contextual to the streets which are there. Okay. Yes. Because if your street is there and you have one side a different language and the other side a different language, it does not speak well. Yes. And so we needed to see that our buildings spoke a similar language, not 100%, but they kind of said that it was from the same family yes. and made it contextual to the streets which were there. People around. will connect more They're to more it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So this is the last question of this particular segment and rapid fire is coming your way, okay? <laughs> so this is the last question of this segment. As an architect, what legacy do you hope your projects will leave behind for future generations, both in terms of physical structures and societal impact? So, uh, you know, it's a tough question. Yes, uh, that's why it's the last question. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, we have worked on schools, we have worked on hospitals. And we have worked on hotel hospitalities. We have worked on uh, some government projects also, which are very interesting. So I don't know whether uh, I can say that I'm going to leave a legacy. Okay, I can't say that it is for people to absorb that and say that you know I'm leaving something behind. But if so, then uh, for sure uh, one thing is there that you know, as I said earlier also. Every uh, architecture opportunity that you're getting to do something, you're getting a new canvas. And uh, there is, you know, so much to inspire yourself to do something different every time. And I think that is one of the biggest legacy the youngsters should take it up from. That don't go by saying that I can just repeat what I had done here, you know. And uh, for at the social impact level, you know, yes, uh, when you try to be, make buildings which are trying to speak to one another, which are getting contextual, getting connected to the surrounding, then for sure you're making a social impact on this. Yes. So that was a first segment that was really nice. Thank and you. <laughs>
some are bitter, some yes. are sweet, and some are crunchy. Oh, wow. Okay. Nice. This will be the tagline for the yes. whole video now. <laughs> <laughs> so, next one is if you could time travel and collaborate, collaborate with any master architect, who would it be and why? It can be Indian or from abroad. So, uh, yeah, I did mention that I was fancied by uh, this movement in the, uh, you know, post the Second World War or around the Second World War. And when I went to Chicago for the first time, I was quite taken up by these, uh, you know, these black, dark buildings uh, with these steel sections flowing from top to bottom, you know. Constructivism and brutalism. Yeah, big, uh, and, uh, yeah, I would love to have been spent some time with a person like Mies van der Rohe and oh, seen that yes. how would he have uh, worked on these kind of things, you know, which is so, so brutal, so, uh, but still it is so timeless. Yes. Today also when you go and you look at those buildings, they just stand tall and they just stand and, and that lines which go from town to top, you know, it just uh, kind of expresses that whole uh, movement of tall buildings yes. and that structure and everything. It is so pure in its own way. For sure, I didn't get, I have not got a chance to do something like that. But if I had given an opportunity, I would have loved to work with him on something. Oh, that's nice. So, one more question. And this is a bit a troublesome question for you. <laughs> What's the weirdest request a client has ever made? And did you incorporate it in your design? Uh, uh, it should see, be the weirdest. Uh, well, uh, I don't think I ever had such kind of an issue uh, majorly. I don't remember uh, something like that. And uh, because uh, we always tried to work around what was told to us. And I think uh, the Indian clientele is quite uh, literate not to ask something like that. So I have not really had that experience. One of the experience, only thing that I had had is uh, I had these buildings, uh, technical institute I was doing, and the buildings were very differently painted with walls and murals and different things. And suddenly one day the client comes and says, I want the whole building to be painted in one color. That's oh it. My God. And when we went on site, all buildings were painted in one color, you know, and we just didn't know, we were just looking at it. And we, so it was one of the odd things. Yes. But that was the only I remember an odd thing that had ever happened. Okay. Do you listen to songs? Yeah, once in a while I do. So if your architecture portfolio, your designs have a theme song, what it would be? So my architecture portfolio is, uh, uh, it's a different platter at every point. But uh, to get to that, for sure I need, uh, you need a lot of motivation. You need a lot of spirit. So. Yeah, I, uh, you know, we've been listening to so many songs. So, uh, but one song which kind of, uh, I don't know if it talks about an architecture portfolio, I'm not too sure. But one but which what if it gets going for you? Yeah, it's a kind song. of a, a, is that Rangde Basanti song of uh, Ruba Ru, oh, you know. That's, that's a really good song. And uh, yeah, when you listen to that song, there's something in that it song. It has soul. It has a it soul. It has soul, what you talked about just. Yeah. So it has, that's why. If you could live in any building you design, which one it would be? I know it's a bit hard for you to answer. No, no it's not hard because okay. I'm, I'm staying in the building which is designed by me oh, and wow. I'm enjoying it. Oh, wow. But, 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 <laughs> that is a residential building. Yes. But another example which was uh, very different was, uh, I'm not, not saying I, would stay, I was able to stay in that thing, was uh, the school I did at Bhopal, the Sanskar Valley. Mm -hmm. And I was very privileged that someone gave me a 36 acre of a valley to work on. And rather than making a building, I had these different blocks because I wanted it to be something like when child centric, that was the first thing. And secondly, by the time the trees grew, I didn't want anything to be seen. And there were times when I used to, I had no work in Bhopal, but I used to just call them up and say, I'm coming. And, you know, you see those steps which are there in that f picture which is there of Sanskar Valley, yes, yes. you know. Uh, the, uh, and that is where the admin block was there. The right side, you know, you come here, right side, the, the amphitheater. amphitheater. Yeah. And I used to, when this, after school had started, I used to just go and sit on those steps. And I used to just kind of uh, feel that, you know, wow, what a thing it is. I wish I was a child and I was back into this school. Wow. 
So uh, I live in a building which is designed by me, but yes, given an opportunity, there are so many such things which I would like. The office which we did in Ahmedabad, which is just 2,000 square feet with this sort of match, you want to sit in an office like yes, that, yes. you know, where, so it is not necessary that it is just a residential, but it can be anything. And yeah, I go there and that client tells me, today, whenever I go there, it's your office and still one cabin is there, you can come and sit here, you can do your meetings here. It is on the outskirts of Ahmedabad, so it's very difficult, but every time I go, I just want to spend that 10 minutes in that office. Is that Terra House? Yeah, the ah, Terra House. Yes. I, so, I got, while you are explaining, I thought so about that. I forget the names, but Terra yeah. House. So, I just go there and spend that 10 minutes, I have a cup of tea and I leave, but whenever I'm there, I'm just, I just feel so positive in that place. Like, while seeing the photographs, I could sense that feeling there. And similar thing is the place where I stay, it is uh, uh, personalized living that we have created in South Bombay and the spaces are so beautiful that, uh, you know, we just love to be there with the heights that I've given, so it's, I'm okay. I'll, I don't mind staying there and I don't mind going and sitting in these offices and these schools which I have done. Okay, so last question for you. If any, like from any of your ongoing project, your client is watching this video, what you will tell them? <laughs> uh, I'll just tell them that, you know, uh, enjoy what I'm doing, okay? <laughs> and uh, I thank every client of mine, firstly, for uh, standing up to me. Uh, I thank every client for listening to me and uh, understanding me and doing, uh, getting convinced by me to do whatever I have told them, you know. So uh, let's continue the journey, let's make some nice projects, let's do some eco-friendly sustainable working and uh, yeah, let's uh, try and uh, leave a legacy behind. Yes. So I, I hope you found these questions to be very new and very energetic like like before maybe you have not answered those you've tried to make it little candid and fun and i think you are the whole soul winner of this rapid fire round <laughs> and just like karan Johar does we have a small hamper for you oh, wow. so i never thought that i'll win you know because so, I, so this is a small hamper from our side for you thank you thank you so much you know thank you so thank much you, thank, you. thank you those questions are amazing Yes, it was a first experience for me and uh, on a rapid fire. Thank you so much for this interview and taking out time. Uh, I know you have a very busy schedule, you miss some client calls in front of us. But uh, I think there, there's a huge learning and there are huge takeaways for me as well as an architect. And the people who will be watching this video also will take a lot with them. So no, Thank you, thank you uh, you and your team for coming all over here, uh, coming over here. And all you guys, uh, it's uh, very nice. It was a beautiful session. Uh, I was a little uh, jittery because I've never done this before. And, uh, but still, I think uh, the questions were very, uh, since it were connected to our field, uh, it uh, kind of uh, was very nice. It was informative also. And something we look forward to in the near future also, I think. Yeah. So we, we have a ritual which you have to do while yes. we end this video. So this is your camera. Okay. So you have to speak some good things about us, our page and uh, <laughs> say to our audience that they, they have to subscribe my YouTube channel and follow me on Instagram. So I think, uh, what can I say? I think Sagar and his team is here. Okay. And I think uh, this is a wonderful job that they are doing. I was quite amazed uh, when this uh, when they uh, connected with us and they asked us to ask me to sit up here for these que uh, questionnaires and this whole session the session the session was amazing it was uh, as i said very informative it was also knowledgeable to me and i think uh, that this is the future and this is the way to go so i think that um, you know he's doing a great job he and his team so i think we should all uh, uh, you know, join him in what he is doing in his endeavor and see that, you know, we support him at the Instagram level and all the other levels that he's connected with. Thank you. So all the links are in the description. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much, sir, again uh, for your time and all the wonderful insights you gave it to us. Thank you. Thank you.